and start on lecture 11. My topic today is realism. The lecture has four parts. The first, which stands as really a very long introduction, is quite general in its character. I discuss some background issues, remind you of some themes we've already encountered that are pertinent to the issue of realism. And then in the second, I'm going to talk about Popper and realism in the sense of the existence of a world independent of ourselves. In the third, I'll discuss the idea that science should aspire for true theories about the world, and I'll refer briefly to Popper's work in that connection. And then in the fourth part of the lecture, I'm going to be concerned with realism in relation to Popper's three worlds. Just as a kind of warning, I should say, that the first part is much, much longer than the others. So by the time we get to the end of that, don't despair because the other sections are really comparatively brief. So then, some basics on Popper and realism. In Popper's view, we should aspire in science for knowledge about the world. His motivation for this seems in part to be one of intellectual adventure, and a wish to understand and explain things. In part, his concern particularly with realism in the sense of the existence of a world independently of ourselves and of other people in it is an ethical concern that we shouldn't countenance theories which do not deny the reality of other people's suffering. There are th three aspects to his realism. The first is a common sense realism taking as our starting point the reality of the world and it as transcending our knowledge, rather than seeing the world as something that is just constructed from our sensations. The second is what I've earlier called aspirational realism, the idea that science should aim for or aspire to developing realist theories which try to grasp the truth about the world. And third, there is Popper's three worlds theory. Just by way of background, it's not without interest that the young Popper assisted with the translation of Lenin's materialism and empirical criticism uh, from Russian into German. The basic translation was apparently done by a Hungarian who, whose German wasn't altogether colloquial and Popper seems to have assisted him in polishing it up. Now, this is interesting because in this book, Lenin takes issue with various Marxists who wanted to recast Marxism on the basis of Ernst Marx's ideas about so-called neutral monism. Lenin argues that, first of all, it is despite Marx's wishes in fact, a form of subjective idealism, and also that it's ethically problematic. Popper himself wrote, as far as I can see, without making any reference to Lenin, in some detail on the first point, and uh, particularly talking in this connection about uh, Berkeley, um, who was... Uh, a proponent of uh, such a view. Uh, and on this, a note on uh, Berkeley as a precursor of Marx and Einstein is in Conjectures and Refutations. But Popper was also clearly in sympathy with uh, Lenin's ethical concerns as well, as one can see, for example, from Objective Knowledge, Chapter 2. However, there seems to be no reason to treat Lenin as having been a significant influence on Popper's work. And the stuff that he did about um, Berkeley was, uh, uh, sorry, I should say Berkeley, what was uh, really uh, documented in some detail uh, uh, in terms of a reading of Berkeley's texts. 
Now, what about Popper's scientific realism? For Popper, it's crucial that we should distinguish on the one side, the issue of whether theories aspire to be true or false, whether they are the kind of things which are candidates for being true or false, and within theories that so aspire, we need to distinguish that some may be true and others false. So that for Popper, you could have a realist theory that is true, although clearly we can't tell for sure that it is true, but also you may have a realist theory which actually is false. That's to say we must not in approaching Popper muddle up the issue of the falsity of a theory with the issue of whether or not it aspired to be true, as opposed simply to being a useful way of making predictions, or as a way of pigeonholing our knowledge. Popper's ideas are at odds with those who are self-consciously instrumentalists about science or conventionalists, and possibly with those like Quine, whose methodology may well end up giving us views of this character. Popper's approach also contrasts with that of people who might claim to be realists, but who, from his perspective, are either too strong or too weak in what they're claiming. What do I mean? Well, first, he would disagree with those who aspire to what they consider to be a form of realism, but for whom claims about realism are relativized to human cognitive capacities. What Popper is after is theories which are making claims that are true or false about the world. That's to say, he disagrees with people who don't take realism to be making truth claims about things that we have no way of settling. Uh, Van Frassen's The Scientific Image is an example of such a view. Alan Musgrave's critical essay about it, Realism versus Constructive Empiricism, offers a kind of Popperian critique of that. Uh, it's to be found in the collection Images of Science, edited by Churchland and Hooker. And it's somewhat, it, it's a collection which, if you've got interest in uh, a philosophical argument about these things, is, is a nice collection to look at. Popper would also, though, disagree with those like Hilary Putnam at one point, or also Bill Newton Smith, who claim that our current theories must refer, that's to say, if our theories are reasonably successful, they must in some sense be correct in what they're claiming concerning entities. What though is the point of Popperian realism? Well, first it sees science is in the business of trying to explain things. That's to say, as offering an account of the world and its origins and of our place in it and so on, which realists argue if you're not a realist, your account of science will not provide. That's to say a true realist theory will tell us about where we have come from, may say a lot about the origin of the universe and the origin of us and so on. Obviously, uh, it's, uh, our actual knowledge about these things may aspire to tell us uh, how all of this stuff works, but uh, we can't be sure that it's true. Also, true realist theories are indeed Realist theories may lead to striking problems, as in many ways in the whole history of modern philosophy since Descartes. For much of the agenda of philosophy since Descartes is posed by the question of how to make sense of human related issues in a world as it's starting to be disclosed by a realist science. As to say, if you take the aspirations of a realist science seriously, then all kinds of problems are posed. What is the role of consciousness? 
Does it interact with the physical world? What about our hopes and fears? What about ethics? I mean, over and over again, it's taking a realist view of science, which uh, gives us a whole lot of the problems which are on the agenda for philosophy. Second, realism is of methodological importance for science itself. Because if you're an aspirational realist, you won't be happy with any scientific theory that's not open to a realist interpretation. There may be theories which are powerful, to which we can't think up an alternative, but that isn't for the realist enough. If they're not open to a realist interpretation, the realist is going to try to see if there is despite appearances, some way in which we can make sense of them from a realist point of view, or alternatively, if we can discover another theory which is realist in its character and which corrects them. In addition, if you're not a realist, then there's no problem about your using theories or postulating entities which, if they were interpreted realistically, would be inconsistent with one another. Your uh, view, if you're not a realist, could be that science is a bit like a set of spanners or something of this sort. And you use one spanner here and one spanner there, and uh, it's going to be really uh, just a matter of your uh, uh, aspiring to use the right theory in the right place. All you'd need to do if you're not a realist is just to make sure that each of the theories is used in its proper sphere of application. This then means that for the realist, the task of pursuing science becomes more challenging than it would otherwise be. A non-realist may be perfectly satisfied with powerful predictive theories which work. If they're not, open to a realist interpretation, the realist is going to be unhappy about this. And Paul Farabend has an interesting essay about this in his contribution to the uh, Bunga Fester for Popper, The Critical Approach. It's important though to bear in mind, and for the realist to bear in mind, that he or she mustn't assume that people if they're not realists, have just sort of taken up non-realist views casually. And it's interesting that Farabend, over time, really came to the view that there were good reasons why uh, uh, people were holding non-realist views in some areas of science. So there's a shift over time in his views. And I think that all realists would say, look, we, we want to have realist theories, we are by no means sure we're going to be able to get them. One may also find that realism clashes with current science or with current understandings of the significance of specific, significance of specific pieces of science. As a fallibilist, the Popperian aspirational realist can argue that we should look for new theories which can be interpreted realistically. Popper himself tried this with regard both to the arrow of time and in relation to quantum theory. I will in the latter part of the lecture say a little bit, but only a little bit more about those two things. At the same time, for a critical rationalist, this isn't a matter of the philosopher coming in and just telling the scientist that he or she has made a mistake. Rather, the aim of, of aspirational realism typically offers us a challenge as to what we should be aiming for, and where indeed one can document sometimes in the history of science that there have been ongoing disputes between people who are realists and people who are uh, not realists. And the production of a realist theory which does better than current non-realist ones may represent an incredible intellectual challenge 
which indeed, while we might aspire to be able to uh, resolve this, we may well not be able to meet it. What about lessons from science? A key issue here for the critical rationalist is that one needs to take seriously the current content of science and the idea that future theories need to be able to explain its successes to date and more. I'd refer you again to the material in truth, rationality and the growth of knowledge uh, on these uh, additional requirements, which I talked to you about on a previous occasion. At the same time, the critical rationalist may express skepticism about any current theory or about the metaphysical lessons that someone wishes to draw from current science when it's understood realistically. And so you have on the one side of taking seriously of current science, of uh, aspiring to have true realist theories, but a certain ambivalence is possible in terms of what current science is saying. That's to say, the realist may complain about, say, idealist philosophical consequences being read off current science. But if one makes such a complaint, the fact that one done so may equally caution us about not taking too seriously current realist science just because other people could say, well, that might well itself be superseded in the future. It's here worth noting the role of ideas from biology and physics in Popper's own work. And what I'm saying here effectively is there are times when Popper giving an exposition of his philosophical ideas refers to ideas in biology and physics realistically understood. And so uh, if one is uh, uh, interested in these things, it's well worth thinking, well, just what is the status of this stuff? Popper, as you know, initially did research work in psychology. And while he abandoned this and instead tended to emphasize philosophical issues as being pertinent to the kind of areas in which he was previously interested. There is nonetheless an interesting coming together of strands from his earlier work and the naturalized Kantianism that he discussed with Julius Kraft. One finds, for example, in chapter one of Conjectures and Refutations, Popper putting forward epistemological ideas, but also referring to uh, the uh, expectations that uh, he thinks uh, animals have. And this is harking back to his earlier work on, on animal psychology. And one gets this at times even more strongly in the self and its brain and say in some of the essays in the first part of the collection, All Life is Problem Solving. Well, there is an interesting interplay between indeterminism and biology in Popper's Compton lecture of Clouds and Clocks, which is now to be found in Objective Knowledge. What about issues that people might raise just trying to clarify matters to do with realism? I'd start what I'm going to say here by offering you another mini sermon against analytical philosophy. As a critical rationalist, I am, as I previously indicated, strongly opposed to the enterprise of analytical philosophy. By this, I mean the view that we can resolve philosophical problems by way of analysis, that we, we face puzzles or problems, and that how to resolve them is to get you know, uh, clear-headed analytical philosophers to sort of uh, break down the problem into small bits and supposedly then resolve it. And where this analysis is itself by these people seen as being neutral in its character. In my view, by contrast, the entire area of our knowledge is best seen as a field within which different approaches contend to resolve problems. And 
different approaches try to reach the truth. In this context, analytical problems may arise in the sense of things that on an ad hoc basis need clarification. And we can of course develop lines of critical argument, either of shared common sense knowledge or within different research programs. But in my view, any neutral ground in terms of which we're trying to conduct these inquiries has basically to be constructed across or between the different perspectives. I would hope that everyone, if they are conscious of their own fallibility and the possibilities of learning for one another, would be motivated to engage in this. But in my view, we would expect what is constructed on this basis to be ad hoc, and so something that could always be overturned if other people come into the conversation and start to ask interesting questions about it. And there's also every reason to suspect that it may in time be subject to criticism and one hopes improvement after further renegotiation. One other issue which is worth noting has been raised in discussions about realism is that realists sometimes argue that non-realists need to explain that there is a clear division between non-realist theory on the one side and observation on the other, something which they would say looks historically problematic. And there is interesting literature here about the way in which once people started looking uh, through um, magnifying glasses and once one had uh, more powerful microscopes or even once people get to my age, uh, uh, glasses are developed that actually work uh, and through which one can see things. The question is, well, what really is observable? I mean, it seems in many respects to be a fuzzy line, but if you're a non-realist about theory, very often people have argued, well, uh, you have to distinguish clearly between theory and observation, but can one actually do this? What is observation? Observation with the naked eye or eyes with glasses or microscopes or whatever? Telescopes, what about observations made uh, of the behavior of particles in cloud chambers? Also, there is a problem about entities. What do we take to be real? Well, a pl plausible candidate here which I'm going to say a bit more about later, is what can have causal effects on real objects. It was argued that atoms could not be interpreted realistically, but it seems not implausible that Brownian motion, this um, minuscule motion of all sorts of particles, is actually a product of their impact. But, and this again is crucial, what a critical rationalist takes to be being claimed to exist are entities as postulated by our theories. And our theories are fallible. And our claims about these things may well be incorrect, even if our theories have so far been well corroborated. I'll just make one final point here. I've suggested, and it's certainly the case, that uh, instrumentalists about science seem committed to the idea that there is a clear division between what is the uh, observable and what is a, a theory which is not to be taken as realistic. One way to go which could merge these but from a non-realist perspective are the kind of views that pragmatists have espoused. But I think uh, if you come across someone who wants to claim uh, in, 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 in a way that uh, nothing is to be taken realistically, uh, you need to uh, work with them and to, to discover in more detail what their particular theory in this area amounts to. Another interesting issue concerns so-called fact-correcting explanation and depth. Popper in the aim of science following Duhem, 
argued that fact-correcting explanation was significant. And he gave this and also Popper suggested that fact-correcting explanation gave us an indication of depth. That if we had things which we had taken to be uh, what the world was like, or which we'd taken just to be reports on observations, and we're led to correct these, and then indeed the corrections that we suggest are tested and corroborated, Popper suggested this might be a way of indicating that our knowledge is getting deeper. Certainly, it seems as if correction of, of what had uh, been taken to be given by observation in the light of claims made by a realist theory is very suggestive. At the same time, we, we have to ask questions about just what it suggests just in the sense that while it may suggest that there's something behind the appearances which we were trying to understand, and indeed it may suggest that the world is itself structured, and that we may in some sense be making contact with it, but nonetheless it's not clear that we can equate what our current theories are telling us to be the case that's to say the ones in the light of which we make these corrections with what in fact is true. There are also some problems for realists. Uh, Popper's postscript is well worth uh, reading in this context. In the postscript, he mentioned that he had a certain concern that realists may end up with, proper, uh, uh, with properties being claimed for the world of quite a striking kind, which there seemed to be no real hope of explaining. That's to say, we might claim that there are certain underlying laws or certain underlying uniformities in nature, which we can't explain. It would also seem that to the degree to which explanation explains one thing in terms of another, we're always likely to end up with things that are conjectured to exist, but are not themselves explained. The main problems that have widely been taken to face realists, however, are epistemological. First, a critic may argue from the underdetermination of theory choice by data to suggest that choosing one rather than another particular realist theory is just in some way arbitrary. That's to say, they may say that they're could be many theories compatible with the evidence that we have, or indeed with any possible evidence that we could get. Although one needs to ask here, is this about us and our current limitations? And if so, are these limitations about evidence things that might be got over? I mean, clearly there are at the moment, or the were through much of human history, uh, limits to what observations could be undertaken in terms of the temperature uh, of things which you are investigating. And these might have been thought to pose insuperable problems in terms of possible evidence. However, it's pretty clear that there have been remarkable developments in human knowledge here, such that it's difficult to say that there are anything but temporary barriers of this kind if we have the appropriate apparatus? Or are people claiming that uh, they're invoking issues which aren't in principle open to testing at all? So it is asked, how come it makes sense to go for one specific realist theory rather than another when we have no way of deciding between them? This possibility may obviously be heightened if one is willing to entertain Goodmanesque theories that I was talking about in an earlier lecture. Critical rationalists here may argue that Popper offers methodological reason for preferring certain kinds of simple theories, that they're more testable, just because indeed of their higher testability. This can be helpful, but I don't know quite how far this gets us. Uh, 
Nicholas Maxwell has criticized Popper at some length and has argued for an alternative, claiming in effect that science only makes sense if we make certain pre metaphysical presuppositions about simplicity. I think that Maxwell is right in stressing our wish for the intelligibility of the world. My own feeling is that this is likely to leave us with different contending programmatic ideas. Uh, theories might be atomic, uh, they might be the uh, theories about fields, uh, fields of forces. I mean, different possibilities are here, and Maxwell seems to think that once you pose this kind of question sufficiently hard-headedly, then uh, you have got something which is clearly going to be the most rational approach and which can also act as a sort of heuristic for the development of science. Maxwell's own approach seems to me personally to overrate just how telling the particular programmatic approach that he favors is. But at any rate, if you find these kinds of issues interesting, Maxwell is in many ways working in the same tradition as Popper when Popper is concerned with cosmological approaches within philosophy. There are also issues raised by the work of Larry Loudon. He's argued that there are huge problems in concluding anything much from the current success of particular theories. If one looks at the history of science, uh, not only may entities or the picture of the world postulated by later theories look very different from uh, how things were depicted by quite successful earlier theories, but that even if the theory is in some sense close to the truth, that would not mean that we should necessarily expect to get true predictions from it in any particular area in which we're interested. This, it seems to me, is all fair enough, but I can't see that it hits aspirational realism in any way, rather than just emphasizing our own uh, fallibility. One other source of criticism uh, of, of realism seems to me to be uh, coming from people who are concerned with verificationist looking issues about meaning. I'm not sure that one needs to take these very seriously, although uh, uh, there are people such as, for example, Dummett, uh, who've done very ser um, serious work uh, in this area. And because I haven't pursued them into detail, I, I don't think that um, it's appropriate for me uh, to uh, sound off about them. One might though ask, well, wait a minute, how is it that we can agree about the meanings of words if our uh, ideas about the meaning of words goes way beyond things that are observable? I mean, how is it that we come, as uh, Popper would typically see us as doing, to be uh, talking perfectly intelligibly to one another about things that go way beyond what we can actually see or verify. In my view, our starting point to this should, should be that we typically share various kinds of interpretative predispositions about the world. These may be things that are built into us biologically. They may be things that are socially shared at different particular times. Or at least most of us do. That's to say, it looks to me as if one element in some types of autism is a failure of this. That's to say that people who suffer from autism do indeed sometimes experience things as we, as, uh, we would if the empiricists were right. Uh, another way of looking at this might be to say that if you consider, say, some of the kinds of um, psychological mechanisms that Piaget suggested, for example, develop over time, uh, you might see some forms of autism as uh, being products of a failure in these things. And one can find, for example, uh, some kids who are autistic just find it extremely difficult 
uh, to handle visually uh, uh, complicated settings or um, situations which which change in in uh, uh, ways that aren't just extremely gradual and simple. But the role of predispositions in all of this may well mean that while we can understand one another, the substantive views of all of us may well simply be wrong. We may be able to agree with our fellow human beings or our fellow citizens various meanings about things, but that doesn't mean that those meanings manage to capture correctly what the world is like. It's also been argued against Popper, for example, by Godfrey Smith in the Cambridge Companion to Popper, that much contemporary scientific work places emphasis on models. It's not clear to me that this poses any particular problem for Popper. First, his approach isn't setting out to be naturalistic in the sense of describing current science. So if there is, and I stress if, there is a discrepancy here between Popper's ideas and that of many practicing scientists. It's always in principle open for Popper or other critical rationalists to say, well, uh, it, it might be useful for uh, the scientists to consider whether they should just be working with models. Second, one can ask, what is taken to underlie the models? And how come that the kind of analysis that the models offer provides the sort of understanding of the world that it does? That's to say, if you, if you just say, I'm going to offer a model, if you make no claims about how this relates to underlying reality, you, you have the question, well, why should it then be able to throw light on anything? Or another way of putting it is, if it is, reasonably successful, what's going on and how can we explain that? This is something that we may be able to explain easily enough in terms of, say, the use of models in economics, where it seems to me that very often what one's doing, and also in some areas of sociology, you're basically uh, suggesting a kind of oversimplified picture of what is going on in uh, respect of people's motivation in some area or uh, in anthropology, say, of their understanding of the world in order to, to derive consequences from this, because what we may be interested in is what are the consequences of people acting as they do? And where if you were to actually ask them, many people may have uh, closely related views about things, but where their detailed understanding of these things may not be shared. In terms of Popper and models, it's also worth looking at Popper's uh, paper, Models, Instruments and Truth, uh, which is in now the collection, The Myth of the Framework. Third, what happens if we just stick with models to our wish to understand the world and our place in it? However, one can also ask, and here uh, I may just simply be uh, naive and ill-informed, if we make use of models which deliberately oversimplify, how does testing work? That's to say, if I use a model of something, I will know that in some senses, our model is false. But if our model is false, then we can well expect that explanations making use of it could have false consequences. So uh, something that, that I'd like to float and on which I, I would be happy to be uh, uh, sorted out by someone who knows about this stuff is, uh, if we're working with models, what can we conclude from falsifications? I said that this was the first part of the paper and that it was long. Before I move on to the much, much shorter latter parts of the paper, uh, I'll try and sum up a few tentative conclusions. First, I'm not sure that there are any problems from this material about aspirational realism, although I think it's perfectly true that there may currently 
be certain areas in the natural sciences where we have successful theories to which we can't give a realist interpretation and where we it doesn't seem as if we can come up with better theories. But fallibilism also makes it difficult to conclude too much from current science. It can tell us essentially that so far we've been successful, so far we've been able to explain a bunch of things, and we want future theories to be able to explain at least as much, but the terms in which they might do it may be very different from our current theories. For example, who knows what kind of cosmology we will end up with? Uh, when I was at university, uh, there were books that offered kind of simple pictures about the atom and simple pictures about the, the universe. There, seem, there seems now to be a kind of vast proliferation of, of, of particles. Uh, there seem also to be lots of weird and wonderful ingredients sloshing around in the universe. And I, I guess uh, I just wonder, can we currently make a good overall sense of this? What are we to do with what I believe are still various different physical forces? Uh, are we, can we aspire to interrelating them all to one another? I, I mean, who knows? And this who knows may be in part just my ignorance, but also that even if someone was able to tell a very neat story, how much sticking power is it likely to have? We can certainly work in thinking about things as if current ideas were true. But if we do that, is there not a risk that we may take them too seriously? Some bad consequences of this are, in my view, displayed in some of the writings of JJC Smart and some other people in Australia who followed him, who kind of take the current picture of things offered by science as if it is pretty much the truth so that it becomes then a sort of Procrustean bed into which everything else has to be fitted. And I think this may be overrating what we know. He argues from current scientific ideas to, for example, the falsity of dualist interactionism in the philosophy of mind. The work of Nicholas Maxwell, to whom I referred before, can be seen as continuing the cosmological tendencies in Popper's work. He also has been someone who, like Popper, uh, was unhappy about uh, aspects of quantum theory that you couldn't uh, interpret realistically. And also, like Popper, he was driven uh, to go into the detailed scientific work to see if he could offer a better account. But he does this on the basis of a distinctive theory that certain kinds of rational aspirations for science have to be presupposed to make any sense of science at all. But he then thinks that if they are presupposed, the correctness not just of realism, but of physicalism of a distinctive kind should then become clear. He's an interesting guy whom I know very well, but I can't agree with his overall approach. And I've offered a criticism of his ideas in relation to the mind-body problem. There was a sort of small festrip put together on his work. And I wrote about that. Uh, he responded to it, but I'm unconvinced by uh, as to uh, whether his response is actually any good. Let me now move to small section two of the, of the talk the reality of the world. This for Popper isn't something that one can show to be true, but he does offer some arguments against alternatives. In the background, I think one could say, there's Popper's argument against our starting with our sensations and building up from there. It is this approach which typically forms the background to non-realist views. I mean, one can see this in, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, for whom uh, the world was really uh, something like the permanent possibilities of having certain kinds of sensations. In part, 
Popper takes this view for reasons that we looked at earlier in our treatment of his views about basic statements. In part, it's because of his view that our knowledge starts really with theories and expectations rather than being based on sensations. Not only in Popper's view is the starting point of many empiricists wrong, but it is a view which is apt to lead one into subjective idealism, into the view that really all you can know is your own sensations, and maybe even to solipsism, that it's only your sensations which are real. A second line of argument is that uh, the a denial of realism seems to have implausible consequences. But if all there is, is in some sense my sensations, then this seems to risk making oneself or possibly oneself and one unconscious mind, the author of everything, including works of art, the power of which one cannot even imagine or mathematical proofs, which one can't even understand. I mean, these things are around. We are utterly amazed by some of these things. And uh, Popper has suggested a bit of a, a problem uh, if you get led to subjective idealism is that you become in some odd sense almost the author of all these things yourself. This indeed reminds me of a nice point made once by Bertrand Russell, who recounted that he'd received a letter from a correspondent. Uh, Russell was well known as a philosopher, and so all sorts of people would write to him. And this person complained strongly to him that they'd written a paper which proved that solipsism was true, that in fact, they were the only person who actually existed, that everyone else was a kind of a construct from their sensation. And their complaint was that they'd written the paper, but no one would publish it. And if you think about it, I mean, given that they're arguing that no one else actually exists, it seems a rather strange complaint to be making. Joking apart, it's well worth reflecting that as individuals, we're far from autonomous. We depend on critical input from other people to learn a language, and to develop our intellectual and moral personalities. There's a guy called Andrew Locke, who's written what I thought was a very interesting book called The Guided Reinvention of Language, talking about the role that interaction with other people crucially plays in our acquisition of language, that he suggests we have to sort of invent for ourselves, but uh, where this process is guided by other people. And uh, similarly, I think, but some of what Adam Smith says in his theory of moral sentiments about the way in which our uh, ideas about morality are the product of the internalization of other people's judgments is really very interesting. Well, obviously, we develop from infants who are crucially dependent on others through the different stages of our lives to the point which I, I guess I can look forward to if that's the right world, where again, one becomes crucially dependent on others again, through which we're also subject to physical processes over which we have no control whatever. And I mean, there's a sense in which it seems to me, we depend crucially on other people, animals, plants and on the physical world and its properties. And on the face of it, a common sense realism about this corrected over time by our developing scientific and other knowledge seems to me the most obvious metaphysical view here to take. Well, to take everything as being in some sense simply a construction from our sensations just seems really very odd. More generally, subjectivist non-realist views seem to offer no explanation as to really what is going on. I mean, a, a realism offers a conjectural picture of how we should understand ourselves and our situation in the world. Subjectivism, it's not that clear, unless, as it, Bishop Barclay, it turns out 
that there's also God there, who in fact squares everything with common sense realism, uh, even though uh, all uh, we have direct knowledge of on his account is our sensations. What about a moral argument? One issue to which Popper refers is that the denial of realism seems to involve one in denying the reality of the suffering of other people. It's a serious point, and it's a point on which Lenin also had touched. It's interesting and striking, but I think we need to be careful here. For while we should not likely accept a metaphysical theory, or indeed a scientific one, think back to the discussion of the selfish gene earlier on, which tells us that the suffering of others either isn't real, or if it is, that there's actually no moral reason for us to be concerned about it because uh, um, theoretical ideas about morality don't in fact make any sense. But we also need to be careful that we don't take what seems to me the terrible step of allowing what we take to be true to be shaped by our moral and political sensitivities. I don't want to give you a, a sermon on uh, the political aspects of that these days, but one can give lots of examples from different points in the political spectrum. Our moral sensibilities can, it seems to me, perfectly respectably lead one to develop a metaphysical research program which seeks to vindicate an approach to which one is attracted. But it's one thing to be attracted to such a program, quite another to produce a, such a research program that is coherent and can withstand criticism and which can then go on to deliver in terms of actually providing scientific explanations that are better than those produced by others. So I'm not saying moral judgment here has no role. I think we shouldn't give up too easily on things uh, uh, give way too easily to things which undermine our common sense moral judgments. I think though they can be called into question, but that we need to be very careful to make sure that we've got good uh, uh, philosophical and ideally then good scientific theories to vindicate a specific perspective to which we're attracted, that we shouldn't, as it were, just make do with wishful thinking. Next, and very briefly, scientific realism. I cannot, as the topics are specialized, and my knowledge certainly isn't, here go into the details of the issues with which Popper was concerned, but I'll comment briefly on two issues that he did consider. First, quantum theory. His views about this actually change over time. I'm really only going to refer to some of his later ideas. The key issue is that Popper thought that it was attractive to see our knowledge of the world as aiming at truth, and as a result, he favored an approach to science which was realist yet fallibilist. This meant that he was in part engaged in argument with philosophers and scientists who favored non-realist epistemologies, but also faced a challenge when our best current scientific theories didn't seem open to a realist interpretation. I'll here mention quantum theory and the arrow of time. The problem that faced Popper here is that quantum theory, as it developed through the 1920s to the 1930s, seemed to be both highly successful, but also not to be open to a realist interpretation. The issues were complex, and it was indeterministic. And you'll find at this point that Einstein didn't like it because he thought that an indeterministic theory couldn't actually be true, that God, as he said, doesn't play dice. He was convinced of that and for a long time was looking to see if he could come up with a deterministic theory uh, which um, could explain what quantum theory was leaving uh, us as being indeterminate. Another problem was that Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg offered interpretations uh, of quantum theory, which were either obscure in the case of Bohr, or which were explicitly in some ways subjectivistic, as in the case of Heisenberg. Popper wrote extensively on these issues. From the logic of scientific discovery, 
through the postscript to his long paper, Quantum Mechanics Without the Observer. His work on or related to this ranged from work on the theory of probability and its interpretation to work on different aspects of quantum theory itself. It and associated work because Popper wasn't the only one who was uh, exploring these things has formed a minor theme in the history of 20th century science. I can't judge how the discussion has gone, but my impression is that there are still problems for people wishing to offer either a fully realist interpretation of quantum theory or a new alternative realist theory to replace it. But that the links that used to be made routinely between quantum theory and various kinds of subjectivism or positivism are now rather less often found in the literature than they were when Popper started writing. The other field in which Popper has been involved concerns the objectivity of the arrow or direction of time. He published about this in the science journal Nature and also in philosophy journals. And he's written about this and some related matters in Unended Quest. The issues with which he was concerned here are in part matters of the interpretation of scientific theories, uh, in part philosophical issues. But it's striking in both of these areas that you get Popper venturing into scientific matters rather than, as some philosophers do, just sort of staying at one remove from what's going on in science and just simply reflecting about it. And his controversies there certainly illustrate the fact that it is no easy matter to pursue the kind of realist aim for science which he favored. It has to be seen, I think, as a programmatic endeavor in respect of which um, Popper uh, sometimes was successful, other times not. And finally, the three worlds and realism. As I've noted before, the ingredients for Popper's ideas about the three worlds have been around in his work for a long time. In the logic of scientific discovery, he made a sharp distinction between psychology and logic, while his writings on the mind-body problem in the 1950s clearly defended a form of dualism, and indeed argued from the significance of the descriptive and argumentative forms of language against the idea of a physicalistic causal theory of human language. In addition, his Of Clouds and Clocks advanced some striking ideas which brought together indeterminism, an interpretation of evolutionary theory, and arguments about the mind-body problem. As a result, while his ideas about three worlds were an innovation in terms of terminology, it was in many ways a matter of putting into a dramatic and striking form ideas which had been around in his work previously. In The Self and Its Brain, Popper argued for the realism of all three worlds. One argument that he offered for the reality of world three is that it can, through the mediation of world two, have an effect on the physical world. The argument is striking, not least if one thinks about it by way of the effects that the theoretical content of our ideas can have on the physical world, by way of such things as our ability for good or ill to generate nuclear fission, and by such means make really dramatic changes to the physical world. At the same time, it also seems to me important to note that Popper, in the self and its brain, disavowed the idea that he was offering an ontology, and that in principle, he would accept that claims about world three might be open to fact-correcting explanations of the kind which we've discussed in earlier lectures. We will indeed discuss Popper's ideas about reduction in the next lecture. Let me here call a halt and let's open the meeting up for discussion. If anyone would, Luke is wanting to raise a, a, a question and then Margareta. Luke. Well, it's not exactly a question. I just want to remark that Popper often 
in several places refers to Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf, but he says, and uh, actually Brian McGee wrote a book about this with a blind philosopher together, uh, how people who are blind and deaf have a correct view of the world. I think popular right somewhere, they plug into world three and that's how they get to know the world. Yeah, yes. yeah. And also, because you said that uh, the idea of these world three worlds, he had this before, because I remember in the beginning of Brian McGee's booklet, there's this quote from the Open Society, man has created new worlds and the most important as well. I think already then he was thinking about these things. Yes, I think that that's right. But I guess what I'd say is when I uh, did the index to objective knowledge for him, one of the interesting things was that um, in indexing it, there was this question, should I put references to world three <laughs> to places where uh, in Of Clouds and Clocks, he was discussing exactly those sorts of ideas, but without using that terminology. And indeed, uh, that is what I did do. Um, but there is, I, I mean, it was strange. I was at the first seminar at the LSE that he gave about World Three, and he sort of developed this and was greeted, as it were, by something of a stunned silence. I mean, people really didn't know quite what to make of it. And I think part of it was just because uh, a lot of the of the substance of what he's saying, uh, you could see as uh, involving things uh, that he talked about, uh, not using a, that terminology before. Okay, Margarita. Um, I have actually many questions, but I'll just start with two or three, and maybe they're just comments also. Um, to, to begin with, uh, could we start? Could we do them one at a time, just on yeah, the grounds yeah. that? And yeah. what I would say is, if someone else wishes to come in to raise a question, um, then they shouldn't hesitate to stick their hand up, and I'll then come back to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, just regarding World Three. Uh, so you. Uh, Okay, maybe the three things. So first of all, there is a triangle of reference of Richards and Ogden. And if you look at that triangle, it, it includes the ingredients of the three worlds. So, so there is the symbol or the artifact. So, so the reason I bring that up is to kind of say that I think of for the three world hypothesis as, as a sophisticated version of that triangle of reference. So it, it has the human agent with consciousness. Then there is the reality. Uh, there's the thing that is called realism. Uh, and then um, there are the artifacts belonging to world three that we use to make sense of the reality. And now my question for you, I are two questions. One is, I noticed you kind of talk about the demarcation and you talked about the observable, but I never heard you say, or maybe you said it a couple of times, the unobservable. So this is that the other side is the unobservable. And by the unobservable, it's meant the things that we cannot access through our senses. And yes, this but, but sorry, can I can I just on that interrupt? Yeah. Uh, simply because the distinction that I was talking about is typically one that some non-realists insist on. That's to say, they will often say, uh, our theories are one thing, our observations are another, our observations are real, the other stuff just has an instrumental character. And they, yeah. would, and they would then say the, the uh, uh, unobservable things uh, are, are not real. Yeah, but so here uh, becomes it. It becomes interesting because the the issue is there is something that's called that we call unobservable. I mean, like we we don't see the future, we never see the past. I can't see your consciousness. I'm assuming you're 
a human being. Eh? Dus I'm not like that lady from uh, that friend of uh, Bertrand Russell. So, um, but there is also the other, and I, I think that's the essence of quantum mechanics. According to quantum mechanics, we don't observe photons. We interact with photons. Our eyeballs are interacting with with photons that are reflected from sunlight and so so the emphasis is all on the interaction and so then that gets me back um, to when popper talks about the three worlds actually the the self and the brain it's in defense of interactionism so it's not about the worlds it's about the interactions um and so that to, to further develop the hypothesis, we, we need to really look at the interactions and that people are too hung up on ontological thinking or, or materialism that they don't focus enough on the interactions. Is that a possibility? Well, sorry, you, you, you've uh, given us a, a, a very wide ranging comments and where particularly the stuff on quantum theory, there are uh, different competing inter uh, uh, views about how one should understand it. So uh, I think we have to leave that to one side. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's just even in Popper that, that uh, uh, quantum indeterminism was seen by some people as an interaction effect uh, as opposed to something where one's talking about bits of reality actually being physically indeterminate. And Popper's own papers from the early 1950s, I mean, he, he wrote a, a couple of papers about this, um, and uh, well, one paper, big paper in two parts, could, could be seen as uh, at that point, endorsing a uh, an interference view. So, um, but look, I think that the key thing is this. Um, if you're talking about the different worlds, there's a question, what are you actually saying about them? And one thing in Popper, which uh, for some people is controversial, is the idea that, uh, people have uh, uh, psychological characteristics which are not reducible to things that are physical, but which nonetheless interact with them and uh, with the physical. He also was saying that world three, I mean, there are books, uh, there are pictures and so on, but there are also as it were, world three objects in themselves, which are uh, the products of human action, but which have an independent existence. Quite what he is committed to here, I think is not altogether straightforward because you could say if someone has an idea, then uh, they are normally to be understood as committed to the consequences of that idea as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, do those consequences exist? Well, on the face of it, it will depend on what rules of inference are in place. And uh, one might relativize in terms of the abstract world three, uh, what there is to the initial statements and then uh, the rules of inference that have been adopted. Occasionally, Popper seems to speak in rather more platonic terms than that, but I, I, I'm not quite sure really how that works. And I think also that it has to be said that Popper was talking about world three in order to uh, draw various lessons from it. He really wasn't particularly interested in trying to set out a detailed theory of world three and he seems at times to have said slightly different and clashing things about it okay do you want, uh more questions uh i'm going to let someone else maybe well i'm ask. not sure if there is someone else <laughs> okay uh well hassan yeah sorry 
Yeah, I, I have a question. Who, uh, sorry, Nathan, sorry who, who? Because, sorry, who's Hassan. speaking? Sorry? Hassan. Hassan, okay, yes, fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, I, I just uh, raised my yeah, hand. No, here. no, no, it's fine. Yeah. It's just that the <laughs> that how Zoom is working now seems to be giving me a clearer picture, but uh, not working in such a way that I get all of the all of the squares up. And so if you're outside of that, I can't see you. So Hassan, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is uh, just uh, this uh, yeah. changes uh, uh, the topic a little bit. And maybe Margareta want, wants to uh, yeah. uh, continue. Well, I, I, I think we've questions. only done one of her 13 yeah. questions. So yeah. Far, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe I, I break the yeah, uh, that, that chain. Uh, in several lectures, uh, when you discussed uh, uh, critical rationalism itself, uh, uh, and uh, when you discussed uh, truth as the aim of science, and also uh, uh, scientific realism, in each of these cases, it seems to me uh, that uh, you argue that the, uh, there aren't uh, completely um, uh, let's say, uh, com conclusive arguments in favor of these. And in each of these cases, uh, it seems that uh, at the end, at the end of the day, we make some sort of decisions. Because if you want to argue in favor of uh, rationalism, then the arguments uh, might be circular. If you want to uh, talk about uh, truth as the aim of science, maybe others have other uh, aims uh, considered. So when we want to make this sort of decisions to consider truth as the aim of science, to be a rationalist, to be a critical rationalist, in these sort of decisions, it seems to me that uh, we should uh, ground these decisions on some fundamental concerns, like, for example, survival, as, as Popper himself discusses this in, in uh, and life is all uh, problem solving. But, but again, there is another uh, angle to, to your own uh, 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 ideas that uh, there is a danger if we want to make uh, ethical concerns or our moral sensibilities as that ground. And you discussed this, uh, um, I, I think it was last week yeah. uh, in details. Uh, but still, it seems that if you don't make that uh, any of those ethical grounds, and maybe that that sort of uh, survival that that uh, Popper himself talks in in life is all about problem solving, and then then we do not have any any sort of ground for for that that decision. No, I would take I would take our situation to be one where. Uh, we may be attracted to something and we may think that it's correct, but that the best that we can do is to say, uh, for the following reasons, this seems to me better than the alternatives, but there is no basis that guarantees anything. And, that, uh, and what this means is that one should then be aware that someone may come along and offer uh, a critical argument that you hadn't thought of before, which actually means that you have to modify your ideas. And so in Popper, in his early work, there was a lot of stuff about decisions. My view is he did that because he didn't have a general theory about how things can be critically appraised. And so it seems to me that Bartley bringing out the way in which uh, Popper's view is really a, a non-justificationist view, essentially is saying you don't need to, and it's actually a mistake to try to ground anything. At the same time, you need to bear in mind what constitutes an argument. Someone simply coming along and saying something else isn't an argument against your view. 
someone coming along and saying they don't like your view isn't an argument. What you're after is for someone to show you that there is a problem about your view in terms of it's leading to unacceptable consequences or it's clashing actually with other things that you want to uphold. And in principle, someone may always be willing, always may be able to do that. And I'm struck in this context by the way in which um, while I have as a whole and while uh, uh, as a whole it's kind of incredibly complex and sometimes uh, rather silly, I think that some arguments made by feminists have been extremely important because they feminists have been able to raise the point that a lot of ideas were taken to be generally acceptable or a lot of procedures were taken to be generally acceptable, basically because um, the very people who might have objected to them were prevented by their circumstances from getting anywhere near to the discussion. And I think that there is always the, the possibility that we may discover things that actually upset stuff which we had taken for granted and to which no one is raising an objection, but where what is needed is for someone to say, look, you, you are assuming that this is unproblematic, but for the following reasons, there are uh, big issues and difficulties about it. And I, I would see one of the uh, character, one of the distinctive features of Popper's approach to say, nothing is exempt from that. There may be things which actually we, we are assuming and which are perfectly all right and will never be overturned, but we can't in fact anticipate what problems and issues might be raised. And if someone is coming along and is possibly raising a, 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 a difficulty, we shouldn't sort of stamp on them uh, and we shouldn't sort of uh, uh, smash them in argument because uh, they can't put what they're wanting to do very well. It's, it's more a matter of seeing if we can work with them to get something out of it. I, I re reminded in this context of uh, uh, my old friend, Larry Briskman, who uh, was complaining at one point uh, that his girlfriend uh, would never discuss problems in their relationship with him. And he raises with her and she said, no, I won't discuss them with you because you work professionally as a philosopher and you will win the argument whether or not you're right or wrong. And it can be a bit difficult uh, to avoid uh, using skills in argument uh, in, in ways that actually uh, stop us learning things. Now, I, I don't know if that makes any sense. You, you may not be happy with that as the view, but that, that's what's going on. And this is why I've, I've stressed fallibility all along, not meaning that I seriously think that everything that I think is true uh, is likely to be shown to be false. I just can't tell. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I should admit that uh, it's, it's really difficult um, uh, to uh, for, for one uh, to just uh, uh, get the head, head around it that that even even those concerns like survival or truth or reality even, even those well, even even the concepts of argumentation itself all of those well can, yes except can, but with yeah. regard to truth the yeah. big issue is I would have thought not to, I mean it's possible that someone may show that there are problems about our idea of truth. I would have thought that the issue is more that there are all kinds of things which we take to be true and which really we would be very shocked if they were false, but where we have no way of guaranteeing and I would take the uh, one big argument from Popper to, to, to say, look, you, you need really to stop trying to guarantee these things beyond saying, have we really given a fair crack of the whip to anyone who's got an objection? 
and uh, talk to them about it. Uh, and then we can, until something that comes along which seriously calls our views into question, we, we can hold them. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Now, anyone else want to come in? Or is this Margareta again? Uh, I'll Sorry. give other people a... Okay. So I, I thought it was very interesting uh, the way you brought up in the beginning uh, the issue of inconsistencies and, and the issue of realism. And I, I think maybe you, you put a finger there on uh, the issue, but also for Popper. But it is really about not accepting inconsistencies and paradoxes and conundrums, but to always try to resolve them. And, and that his concern with the instrumentalist and the, and the relativist and the subjectivist and etc. was about uh, that they didn't, uh, that they were happy to accept inconsistencies or they didn't care to resolve them. Well, I, I think that Pop's ethos is whenever we see an inconsistency or a paradox or, or whatever it's called, the conundrum or two conflicting statements, we always need to look at that and say, what's going on here? Why are those things conflicting? Is, is that a, a good way of summarizing okay. two, realism? Yeah. Two comments. First yeah. of all, the first point was really that if someone is not a realist, then because they're not committed to a realist interpretation, say of entities that they're invoking or theories that they're using, they may say, well, it's fine for me to use these here and those over here. Yeah. And so from that point of view, Realism is more exacting and says, no, you, you, you need to take uh, these things uh, realistically. And then if they're interpreted realistically, to note that this may mean that there are inconsistencies and that all these things can't be true. The only problem about it is that one might spot that this is the case. One might spot that there are uh, these uh, contradictions or inconsistencies between our theories. We may not, however, know what to do about it. And so the realist in many ways has, I think, it, realism I would take in many respects to be a sort of program for research, which says, if you're a realist, you want to try to achieve true, powerful, realist theories, although it may be the case that you don't yet know any more than that what other people are happy with, you're not happy with because there are inconsistencies. So if I take and translate that then that this uh, methodological rule then to, to to be concerned when you see a contradiction. So the, the, the existence of the contradiction is what fuels the research that, that you will go as a researcher and, and talk with other people until you found a way to, to deal with the contradiction. And that, no, Not quite, yeah. because I tried to say uh, before, um, there are two things. First of all, one is, suggesting that people should hold their theories in such a way that clashes or inconsistencies may come to light, okay? And because if people are not realists, then there is no clash. Yeah, well. Okay. That's, <laughs> no, 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 I mean, that, that's, that, that's right. Yeah. Because if someone says, you know, uh, it, it, it is uh, uh, as if, someone was trying to frustrate what I'm doing, and then it's as if here something other else was happening. Well, just because it's as, as if in both cases, there isn't, even if the things clash, there isn't any inconsistency. Okay. Yeah. And then the second thing is this. I think it's important to note 
when there are problems. But at the same time, we may not have any idea how to set about dealing with them. And so, uh, you know, it can be the case that someone points out that there's an inconsistency in someone's ideas. I think the key thing is uh, point it out, be nice about it. For the person also, if they can't respond to say, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a significant point. Thank you very much. But you can't demand that they immediately resolve the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then I had another comment that I think is significant or substantial is when I encountered Popper, that made an impression on me was his criticism of the picture theory of language. And, and I picked that up over and over again. And then I translated it to thinking of language as representational, as many people still do, or to think of theories as photographs of, of the universe. And then I think that the problem this of quantum mechanics was uh, the Sweden Newtonian uh, view of the world. The, the researcher thought of himself literally as a machine designed by a creator observing the world with the perfect eye that it was given. But with quantum mechanics, uh, that picture was shaken up so that the, the comment of Einstein that he doesn't believe that God was a gambler is actually that he doesn't want to acknowledge that uncertainty can be used as, as some objective construct to make a picture complete. Because in a representational view of the world, you, you kind of create the perfect explanation by whatever you cannot explain, you say, well, that's uncertainty, or you say, well, that is paradoxical, and the reality is paradoxical. So what I'm just trying to say is that the, the criticism of the picture theory of language is really, really important. Well, <laughs> look, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think the quantum theory is extremely complicated, but there were two different things going on. I mean, one is, could uh, reality itself be indeterministic, objectively indeterministic? We're talking about things on their own, uh, nothing to do with anyone's interaction with them and so on. And uh, Popper ended up championing the view that uh, it seemed plausible that reality was objectively indeterministic. Yeah. Einstein uh, really found that very difficult to take and wanted um, to try and find an alternative to that. You also have a separate issue, or indeed a whole bunch of separate issues concerning quantum theory about whether uh, what is going on uh, in some sense is not fully objective. And uh, that is a view of which Popper was consistently critical. Uh, but you, in the argument about this, you, you very quickly get into extremely technical matters, which, which really I... I uh, w would have to do a lot of mugging up on, and I also don't have the knowledge in physics to be able to do more than talk about this in a pretty approximate terms. But my own view is quantum theory is really best not brought into contact with other things just because of the uh, very difficult problems uh, that are involved in interpreting quantum theory. Could All I just right. see how we're, how we're doing? Uh, just, is there anyone else who's wanting to, to come in? We're, we're going to come back to Margareta. But yeah. is, is there anyone else who, who wants to raise a, a question or objection? Can anyone see anyone else waving a hand around? Because as I say, the the display stuff seems to have 
become peculiar on this. Um, okay. Well, okay. I want to maybe follow up on what you said about quantum theory. Well, I don't want to talk about well, quantum but, but, theory. But, but, I'm but sorry. I no. say I'm, I'm, I'm the feminist now, the feminist philosopher who says, well, that is all the hand waving of the mathematicians to say, oh my God, it's too complicated. You will not understand. But there are actually very important philosophical and logical questions that Popper with his three world hypothesis is bringing about. And that is that we, we the humans, we created the theory and there is indeed this experiment and the, and the particle wave duality. But nevertheless, we are part of the discussion as humans and we, we cannot, we may refuse to take up certain positions, but we cannot completely stay out of the discussion. And well, I, look, I quantum theory, I'm sorry, but I have here to put my foot down just yeah. because it is a, a, a rather complex subject on which Popper has a, a lot of fairly detailed uh, ideas. I, I could, I mean, possibly for the second series of lectures, I could endeavor to give a kind of uh, an idiot's guide to it, meaning a guide by this idiot. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, but, but I, I, I really, I, I mean, a lot of what you're saying, I think, is presuming exactly some of the ideas that he was arguing against, but that I, I really don't think it would be useful to uh, continue yeah. discussing this particular stuff now. I mean, yeah. if we have a specialist lecture about it, then then fine. All right. Um, <laughs> I rest my case. And Jeremy, if I may give you a compliment, I, I greatly enjoyed the glossary of objective knowledge. That was what impressed me the most. I cannot tell you how many notes I have. <laughs> That was in 1995, that was my first Popper book. And I really was amazed. And I thought, why can't everyone else not do the same thing and have a detailed glossary and index of authors and subjects like Popper did? Because it was so helpful. Uh, oh, but that's very that kind. Book. And you, you, you don't need to be nice uh, in the face of what you might interpret as me being nasty about about what you were saying, but I, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I I am perfectly happy. Well, I wouldn't say perfectly happy, but I'm but I'm perfectly willing to give a, a talk about Popper and quantum theory in the second series. But it it would require that I do a very great deal of reading, and there is this problem that various things that Popper argued uh, are superseded by later work in ways that he didn't point out. There's also some stuff that he wrote about this, which he uh, I, in the end says uh, doesn't actually work. And it, 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 the problem is that the stuff is just intrinsically very difficult and is at odds with how many people often interpret the material. So, um, do may, you have another, I... uh, 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 any other question or objection, but mu it mustn't have anything to do with quantum theory. Uh, oh, okay, maybe then I'll, I'll get back to the contradictions and inconsistency argument. Um, so when, another way that Popper grew on me was, that one day I realized I only have 24 hours in my days and I only will live maybe 100 years. So I never will have access to all the information I need to write an intelligent argument about anything. So I just have to start somewhere and do trial and error and then hope that other people will correct me if my errors are too, uh, too, too embarrassing or something. And so that in the same way that I think Popper is really onto something uh, 
with his three world hypotheses, but that he had to start somewhere. And so then the, it, it may be that he made a couple of mistakes and but, but that it's really about continuing the process. So with this realism, he's trying to point out something. Uh, there's the importance of investigating whenever our views are clashing with each other. And then also the ethical commitment to, to realism basically, and not to just walk away when my views clash with someone else and 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 now we we walk away because we just think we we and now we can use whatever reason we can say ah oh, i'm not a realist or or it doesn't have to be that it can be anything but but that he wants us to when there is a clash he wants us to think about why are we clashing <laughs> yeah look is i that, think then we're not in disagreement about that Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Fine. Any other points from anyone? Because if not, I think, ah, Hassan. Um, I, it's, it's just, uh, uh, I was wondering, I, I don't want to go again to the quantum theory uh, as uh, uh, you, uh, you will have a lecture uh, on that uh, later in on, the, hopefully. In the second series. In the second series. Uh, but is the... Uh, uh, the way particle duality uh, of light uh, is part of uh, the general quantum theory problem, uh, or we, we can uh, address it uh, separately. Because, because it's a very strange thing that there are two theories, two different theories, each of those, not that both explain the same uh, things, but each of those explain some aspects and uh, uh, at the same time, we have to uh, handle those. And, and again, I do not have uh, uh, some, some uh, detailed information from that. Uh, but as far as the, uh, at the surface, we know that there are two theories competing for centuries, but now we can, we can use each of those explaining some parts. When I, uh, when I look at it from the perspective of fact-correcting explanation, then it seems that uh, it's, it's complicated to see which is fact, which is theory, and by which fact we can correct which theory, by which explanation we can correct which fact. So it's a little bit of a, a complication here. Maybe it's, okay. it's just a suggestion okay. to put this as well, as, uh, into okay. your agenda. For well, the, look, I'll, I'll, like, make, I'll make a couple of comments. The first one is that uh, one of Popper's big endeavors was really to argue that the uh, wave particle duality was a confusion and that really what one was dealing with was matters of statistical um, uh, indeterminism um, and uh, where the uh, uh, wave stuff could be seen as a matter of, of uh, st statistical possibilities for the distribution of particles. Now, what one would need to do, though, is to track uh, what his views were over time and what he thinks now works and what and what he doesn't think works. The, the difficulty about this um, and why I wanted to try to put it off the table is that every time someone talks about this, they typically invoke interpretations of this stuff which Popper was engaged against. And uh, so it, it just doesn't help very much to try to argue things um, without more background uh, or just to sort of take off the shelf ways of understanding these things which he's opposed to. The second thing is the fact correcting explanation. The notion here is that you have either observation statements or theories or 
observations which are described in terms of theories and thought to be correct, which if you develop a new theory may actually say, if this new theory is right, then we were incorrect about what we took the facts to be because either we had uh, built into our description or observation of the facts, theoretical ideas which are actually incorrect, or uh, it, it may be the case that um, we hadn't in a way known quite what to look for. And once one has the new theory to hand, one starts to look for other things going on there which if you spotted them might turn out to be inconsistent with the earlier uh, lot of observations. Okay. Yeah, sounds great, thank you. Okay, I had one other person coming in on the chat. Uh, someone has said, I, who was it? Has argued uh, in a particular piece, Norma Rom Pace's Popper as a Positivist. Uh, I, I've never heard of uh, Norma Rom. Um, if you send me the uh, a reference to this, uh, I will look up the paper and uh, give you a comment about that. I mean- Yes, I will, yes, I will, yeah. I, I mean, how can I put it? Uh, I'm going to be talking a bit later about Popper's idea in a subsequent lecture about Popper's ideas about the methodology of social science and his ideas about history and stuff to do with Marxism. Um, the claim of positivism um, can be uh, taking an approach which you get in Auguste Kant, which you get also in um, uh, some uh, empiricists, which Popper disagrees with. You also get notions uh, running through a number of people who've been influenced by Marxian and Hegelian ideas that um, there is in some sense uh, uh, an underlying teleology to uh, political and social development, uh, which is incompatible with uh, an empiricist approach to science. Now, Popper is certainly, has certainly given arguments against teleological views of history of all kinds. Uh, if one looks, for example, at the views which were held by some of the Frankfurt School people, they accused Popper of positivism um, because in some sense they thought that his ideas were limiting um, us to what is the case now and weren't open to future possibilities. As far as I can see, Popper would be perfectly happy if someone wants to come and make a claim that there are other uh, objective possibilities, but would then want to ask, okay, well, you can make the claim, but how can we test this? How can we appraise it? Uh, but I think that the, the best move on this would be if you send me a reference to this, um, is it in a book or a journal? Book, a book. A book is it yes. in a is is it in a book that is uh, 
reasonably cheap to buy. I just say this simply because as I don't have access to a university library, uh, as you may see behind me, uh, I basically have to create my own resources and, and uh, there, there are certain limits to, to what I can take on. So if you send me the reference, if I can buy it used, say, relatively cheaply or as a reasonably cheap paperback, if it turns out that it would cost me, you know, uh, 1000 uh, say, say 120 US dollars in order to buy it i think i'd i'd have to say no we'll have to wait on this one until until i can get my hands on it but send me, send send me the reference and i'll see what i okay can. I will send it. okay now thank you pleasure anything further now because we've gone for about an hour and 3 quarters um i would be tempted to call it a day and to leave our next uh, 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 session to be one on uh, 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 reduction. Is, are you okay with that? Uh, Luke, is that okay? <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that just goodbye? Or are you desperately wanting to ask a question? I just want to say goodbye, that's all. Bye. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> well, I'm sorry if I'm cutting anything off. Uh, I fear I've only just tapped the very top of Margareta's uh, 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 concerns, but uh, you you got not a not a bad innings, if one can so put it. This yeah, if I may, since you bring my name up, so I think it's really the unobservable, and the unobservable is real. There's something real going on, and that that is what Popper is trying to tell us. We need to have a good methodology to deal with that unobservable. Yes. And we cannot just put it all together and lump it together or dismiss it, or we need to do a better job. So anyway. Yeah. Okay, I don't disagree. Thank you all very much. Thank See you. you next week. Thank and you. I'll circulate the notes from this uh, uh, during the course of this week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.